Today we're going to take a closer look at how derivatives help us in business and economics, answering the question, how does the derivative apply to business and economics? And we're going to take a look at a couple different applications. The first we're going to take a look at is inventory cost. And the idea here is that when we keep an inventory on hand, we have to pay for that inventory to be stored somewhere. However, if we need to purchase more inventory, we have to pay shipping costs, and there's costs to get more inventory. So we're always trying to balance this, how much do we want to keep in the storage shed and pay for, versus how much do we want to pay for the shipping cost. And so we're balancing those expenses. And kind of what ends up happening is we order x items. So we'll say up here is x. And then those x items get used up. And then we need to order more. So we order x items again. And now the storage is full. And it gets used up until we have to order more. And so we order x items, and they get used up until we have to order more. And this kind of pattern keeps going on forever. What we're interested in is kind of what's going to be the average cost it's going to take to store these units. And if you look right down the middle at x over 2, that kind of represents the average number of units in storage at any given time. So there's, on average, x over 2 things kept in storage. And we can use that fact to help us build a formula to minimize our inventory costs. Really, there's two parts that make the total inventory cost. First, there's the holding cost. Or sometimes that's called the carrying cost. Or how much does it cost to store the stuff? So we're going to call this function h of x, the holding cost. And to calculate that cost, we look at the holding cost per unit. And we multiply it by the average number of units. And that will tell us, on average, what we're paying for our holding cost. And we actually know that average number of units is x over 2 in red up above. So maybe a better way to say this is the holding cost per unit times the average cost, which we know is x over 2. So that's what it costs to store the stuff. However, it also costs money to buy new stuff. We call this the reordering cost. You might think about this as the shipping and handling, or the order fee, or the processing fee. We're going to call the reordering cost r of x, which is the cost per order times the number of orders. Because it's going to cost more to order 10 times than it will cost to order 5 times. And Let's see if we can break down that last factor, the number of orders. We've got the cost per order, which is usually given to us. 
And for the number of orders, we're usually talking about um, the number of orders in a year. So we can take the total number sold and divide that by the lot size. So if I need to order 100 things, and I order 20 at a time, 100 divided by 20 would give me 5 is the number of times I have to put in an order. So the total number sold divided by the lot size. Well, the lot size is the number of things that we're ordering. That's just x. So maybe we can even simplify this to the cost per order times the total sold divided by our x. And so these two pieces really make up our expenses. The h of x, the holding cost. The r of x is the reordering cost. And when we put those together, we get the inventory cost. The inventory cost, c of x, is the holding cost plus the reordering cost. And we know that we can minimize this by taking the derivative and setting that derivative equal to 0. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to look at our situation, identify the holding cost, the reordering cost, add them together to get the inventory cost, and then we can set a derivative equal to 0. Let's try an example. Let's say a company plans to sell 650 widgets this year. And the cost to order a shipment is $39 per order. But the holding cost are $24 per widget. How many shipments should they order and what size should each shipment be? Well, we're going to break this down into the two pieces. First, the holding cost. And then second, we'll take a look at the reordering cost. First, the holding cost. Holding cost, we know from up above, is the cost per unit times x over 2. So the cost per unit to hold or store is $24 per widget. So 24 is our holding cost times the average, which is x over 2, gives us a total holding cost of 12x. The reordering cost we know from up above, or the cost per order, times the total sold divided by x. Well, a shipment is $39 per order times the total number sold, 650, divided by x. And so if I multiply, we end up with 2,000 or 25,350 over x. Or as we like to say, so the derivatives are easier, 
25,350x to the negative 1. Put all that together, and we know that the total inventory cost is the holding cost, which is 12x, plus the reordering cost, which is 25,350x to the negative 1. To minimize our expensive, we're going to set the derivative equal to 0. So our derivative, using our regular derivative rules, is 12 minus 25,350x to the negative 2. And I'm going to scroll to get me some more workspace. Set that equal to 0. I'm going to add the negative over to the other side to get 12 equals 25,350x to the negative 2. If I multiply both sides by x squared, it gives me 12x squared times 25,350. Divide both sides by 12, and x squared is 2,112.5. And take the square root of both sides, we get approximately 45.96. So let's go ahead and round that to 46 items. We need to order 46 items at a time. How many orders is that? Well, we know there's 650 things total. We divide by 46 items, and that'll give us 14.1. So it looks like we're going to do 14 when we round orders. If we do 14 orders of 46 items per order, we'll end up minimizing our total inventory cost. So just like we did yesterday with optimization, to get the best inventory cost or the lowest inventory cost, we build our function, take the derivative, and set the derivative equal to 0. Our second application problem is going to be what's called point elasticity of demand. And for point elasticity of demand, before we get into the math behind it, we do need to make sure we agree on a couple definitions. And for those of you that have taken some economics course, these definitions are probably review, and you could probably define them better than me. But for now, we'll work with the following definitions. First, point elasticity of demand. is a measure of the change in demand for a product given a change in price. And usually, we have the variable epsilon. It's a Greek letter. Epsilon represents uh, the point elasticity of demand. And when we say something has an elastic price, if the price is elastic, what we're saying is a 1% change in price will make a large change in demand. So if I change the price a little bit, all of a sudden the demand changes significantly. 
Turns out that happens when epsilon is greater than 1. And in an elastic environment, that 1% change will result in less revenue for the company. So we don't like elastic situations, because that's going to result in less revenue as the prices go up. The opposite of that is what's called inelastic, which is just the opposite. A 1% change in price will make little change. in demand. In other words, you could increase the price, and the demand stays about the same. You're probably going to end up with more money as a result. This happens when epsilon is less than 1, and that results in you getting more revenue. Kind of in the middle of both elastic and inelastic, is a situation where you are unit elastic. With elastic, you're charging too much, and you're losing revenue. With inelastic, you're charging too little, and you're not collecting revenue. Unit elastic is that happy middle ground where a 1% change in price makes no change in revenue. So you might have to make more product, but you're not going to make any more or less money, which kind of says, why not keep things the same? Don't change. Don't increase. This happens when epsilon is equal to 1. When epsilon is equal to 1, you end up with the same revenue for your product. So those are a few definitions that we need to be aware of, because we're going to throw those words around as we do the math behind the point elasticity of demand. So let's take a look at a formula. To calculate that epsilon, that point elasticity of demand, we take the opposite of the price divided by the demand function times the derivative of the demand function. So I guess we could say where q is the demand function, in terms of the price p. That is the big elasticity of demand equation. Let's take a look at a couple examples where we actually use that equation to calculate our point elasticity of demand, the epsilon, and then interpret whether that means we're elastic, inelastic, or unit elastic. Let's do some examples. For a particular commodity, the demand function is Q equals 16,000 divided by the cube root of P squared. And we're going to find the elasticity of demand when price is $64. So doing this in a couple steps, we have to find PQ and PQ prime at this point of $64. So first, let's rewrite Q. Q is 16,000 P to the negative 2 thirds. And so if we were to plug 64 into the Q function to find out what the demand is when the price is $64, we get 16,000 times 64 to the negative 2 thirds power, 
which is a nice, pretty 1,000. That's the first part of the equation. The second part is the q prime. So we're going to figure out what q prime is. We know we have 16,000, looking at the blue equation. And for p to the negative 2 thirds, we know we can bring the negative 2 thirds out front and then subtract 1 from the exponent. So we get 16,000 times negative 2 thirds p to the negative 5 thirds. Now we want to see what, how fast things are changing at 64. So we're going to plug 64 into this function as well. So we have 16,000 times negative 2 thirds times 64 to the negative 5 thirds. And if I put that in my calculator, it's not as pretty, but it still comes out to negative 10.42 or so. Now we're ready to figure out what the point elasticity of demand is using that function highlighted in yellow at the top. Epsilon is negative price, 64, divided by Q, the demand. The demand we found out was 1,000 times the derivative. And the derivative we found was negative 10.42. And so when we plug that into our calculator, we find out epsilon is equal to 0.67. 0.67 is less than 1. We say this price point is inelastic because it's less than 1. Putting in words what that tells us is that, let's see, therefore, a 1% increase in price will result in an epsilon percent, or in a 0.67 decrease in demand. Because in most situations, as price increases, demand will decrease. And how much does it decrease? We now know from this uh, point elasticity of demand that it will decrease 0.67%. But because that decrease is less than 1, we can say, and revenue would actually increase because we're getting more money in than we're losing by not selling things. So this is actually a situation where we would want to raise the price to increase the revenue for the company. Let's look at another example. Let's say another commodity. as a demand function q equals 216 minus 2p squared. And we're going to find the point elasticity of demand, or epsilon, when the price is $7. Doing much the same thing we did last time, we'll start with our q function, which is 216 minus 2p squared. And we'll start by saying, what happens when we plug that price of 7 into our function? That gives us 216 minus 2 times 7 squared. That gives us a demand for 118 units. But we also need to know how that is changing as the price changes. So we'll take the derivative of that blue line, the derivative of q, which is negative 4p. 
And we're going to plug into that derivative the price of 7, because we want to see how things are changing right at 7. So negative 4 times 7 is negative 28. Now we're ready to look at that point elasticity of demand, which is negative p over q times the derivative of q. Or in our case, the price is 7 divided by the demand, which we found out the demand was 118, times the derivative, or how it's changing at 7, which is negative 28. Oops, I lost my negative sign up front. And when I plug that into my calculator, now epsilon is equal to 1.66, which is greater than 1, which means I'm in an elastic environment. What that tells us, if we want to interpret this result, is that a 1% increase in price will result in an epsilon decrease, or a 1.66% decrease in demand. But because the demand decreases at a higher rate than the price, then we will say also, then our revenue would decrease because we did not make enough money to offset the loss in demand. So this situation might be a situation where we want to reduce the price of the commodity in order to make more money. We can actually figure out how much the revenue will decrease, or in the previous example, the revenue will increase by doing a little bit of a calculation on the impact on our revenue. Basically, we need to figure out all the pieces of how things are changing. To get our new price, epsilon's always interested in a 1% increase in price. So we'll take the old price, and we'll multiply it by 1 plus the 1%, or 1 plus 0.01. To get the new units, we take the old number of units, and we'll multiply by 1 minus the epsilon. But epsilon's a percent, so we have to divide it by 100. And that'll give us the new number of units we'll sell. And then we can calculate the revenue from there, which is just the new price times the new units. We've talked about this before. The amount of money you make is the number of things you sell times the price you sell them for. And we'll compare that to the old revenue, which is the old price times the old units. So let's take a look at a couple examples where we do just that. Let's say, suppose, epsilon is equal to 0.64. For a 1% increase in price, demand will decrease 0.64%. When selling 130 units for $5. We want to know how does a 1% increase in price affect revenue. Now, because the epsilon, or the point elasticity of demand, is less than 1, we would expect increasing the price will increase the revenue, because the demand is not decreasing as fast. Let's take a look at that. Let's do the new price. 
Our new price, we said we're doing a 1% increase. So we'll take the old price of $5 times 1 plus 0.01. That's going to give us a new price of 5.05. .05. For our units, we did sell originally 130 units. And now we've got one minus because demand is going to decrease with an increase in price, epsilon 0.64 out of 100. And that'll change it to a percent. And so we'll see now we'll sell, on average, 129.168 units. Notice that the increase in price made very small change on the new units. That's because we're in an inelastic environment where epsilon is small. So now I can calculate my new revenue. How much money I make is the price, 505, times the units, 129, 168, which means my new revenue is going to be $652.30. Has that changed from the old revenue? Well, let's look at what the old numbers were. The old price was 5. The old revenue was 130. 5 times 130 is $650. Notice that gives us a change of 652.30 minus 650 we've got a $2.30 increase in revenue. Because epsilon was smaller than 1, we would expect to see an increase in revenue. And sure enough, we did. We went from 650 to 652.30. If we flip that, though, and change epsilon to something bigger than 1.0, we should expect to see revenue decrease. Let's take a look at that. Let's suppose epsilon equals 1.4 when selling 260 units for $9. Same question, how does a 1% increase in price affect revenue. Now we're in an, an elastic environment. Now we would expect to see a small change in price having a bigger impact on demand. Let's look first at the new price. So the old price was 9. We're going to multiply that by 1 plus 0.01 gives us that extra 1%. Now it costs 909, which is going to impact demand, the new number of units we will sell. We did sell 260 units, but now it's decreasing by epsilon 1.4 over 100. When I do that, we get 256.36. Notice we went from 260 down to 256. It's a much more dramatic change than we saw before. So now we can calculate the new revenue, price times number, 909 times 256.36 equals $2,330.31. But when I compare that to the old revenue, what I was making before the price change, the number was 9, or the price was 9. The number was 260 before I was making $2,340 before the price change, which means now we're making less money. Now I can take the 2330.31, and when I subtract 2340, 
I end up with a negative number. It's actually negative 9.69. We've got a $9.69 decrease in revenue because we're in an elastic situation. So that is our applications of derivatives in business and economics. Point elasticity of demand is a major one. You're going to see a lot of those problems on the homework. There's also some problems on holding cost and inventory cost to see how you can minimize the cost of storing your product. Take a look at practicing these. They are not difficult to solve, but they do take a couple practice runs to get used to exactly what you're calculating and how to find it. Come to class with questions, and we will see you then.